All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 28, Section 5, The African-American Struggle for Civil Rights. So one of the most important um, events in the United States since World War II is the Civil Rights Movement. And the Civil Rights Movement is mostly the movement to end segregation in the South. Segregation is the system set up to where there are separate white and black institutions. So for example, we'll be looking at uh, schooling. So for example, when it comes to things like schools, there are schools that are all white schools where only white people can go to, and there are schools that are all black schools in which only black people can go to. And the civil rights movement is really seeking to end this practice. I mean, that's the chief goal. Now, the thing about the civil rights movement is that even though it has existed in the United States, so let's look at an organization like the NAACP, the National, Advance, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, this was founded in the early 1900s, something around 1903. And for a very long time, from 1903 all the way up into the ending of World War II, which is the 1940s slash 50s, uh, one of the chief goals by the NAACP was to get something like an anti-lynching law. And more or less through this period, most congressional bodies, are, are mostly Congress and the president, has, have been rather unresponsive to the demands of civil rights. Uh, we typically say the civil rights movement stretches from, again, the 1940s slash 50s uh, up through 1965. But again, one thing to keep in mind is that the civil rights movement has kind of always been there, you know, really ever since the aftermath of Reconstruction and the aftermath of the Civil War. It is only that in this period that significant progress is made. So you see some um, pretty profound breakthroughs on this front in which uh, usually is why we attribute the civil rights movement, particularly to this time period. Um, so what were some of the early victories? Well, let's recall that back during World War II, the double V campaign, V stood for victory. Victory in the war was one V and victory against racism back at home was the other. And of course, victory in the war was complete. And so this movement to fight against prejudice at home was part of the reason as to why many Americans uh, participated in the Second World War. We talked about previously the action of President Truman, what he did to the military, desegregating the military, making World War II the last uh, war in which black and, so uh, black and white soldiers fought uh, separate from one another. But even upon returning home, there was still discrimination even outside the, uh, outside the South. Uh, and this was especially true in housing, for example. So when it came to the suburbanization and the post-war economic prosperity, African-Americans found it increasingly difficult to find housing on equal terms to their white counterparts. This entire system of segregation um, is based off of a Supreme Court case made way back in 1896 which allowed for separate but equal facilities. So this is the foundation of segregation, right? We sometimes also recall, uh, refer to these laws as Jim Crow laws. So these were laws in the South that allowed for separate facilities to, uh, to exist. Of course, this idea separate but equal was the saying that went along with the Plessy versus Ferguson case because according to the 14th Amendment, um, all American citizens were equal under the law. So Plessy versus Ferguson was kind of a way around the 14th Amendment in a sense because technically they could say that facilities were equal, but the reality was that you know the white school and the black school were not equal, just sort of in, in quotes, right? You know, legally speaking. Uh, but beginning in the 1940s, you had a series of U.S. Supreme Court cases which began to chip away at Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, didn't outright overrule it, but began to strike down certain parts like um, 
For example, you had cases of people being discriminated in higher education. You had segregation on interstate travel. That's to say that you know, busing systems that go from state to state, if it goes from a segregated state to a non-segregated state, uh, it was struck down in those cases. So just kind of some minor, uh, I would say, uh, wins for the civil rights movement in the Supreme Court. Uh, you also had barriers being broken down on the cultural front. Jackie Robin became the first African-American or black MLB, Major League Baseball, uh, player. And so this was once again breaking the color barrier, so to speak, this time in National League Baseball. Jackie Robinson not only was the first African-American, but he was also a very, very good baseball player indeed. Um, however, though, the probably the most important uh, legal victory in this crusade for civil rights came in the court case Brown versus Board of Education. This was 1954. And this was challenging segregation in schools, specifically public schools. There were a series of court cases brought before the Supreme Court, but they more or less, you know, were, was some version of this. There was a black family with a young black girl and there was a school that was literally right next to their home. This was a public school, so it was funded by taxpayer dollars. Let's see if we can sort of illustrate this with a long hair, right? So there's a young African girl, and there's a school that is literally right next to her house, except this school is the all-white school. And according to segregation, she can't go to that one. And so instead, she had to take a bus and go all the way to the all-black school, which is much farther away. And essentially the Brown family sued, said, look, we're paying tax dollars. We should be able to go to the school of our choice. And that's essentially what the Brown versus Board of Education uh, court case was all about, to desegregate the schools. Thurgood Marshall was a lawyer who was uh, um, funded by the NAACP. Again, NAACP is the oldest and probably most important founded by W.E.B. Du Bois, civil rights organizations. And this is what it did. You know, the NAACP would look out for court cases around the country that are challenging discrimination, and they would send the best lawyers, they would send funds, and they would try to win these legal battles. And really in the 1940s and 1950s, they were. So Thurgood Marshall made the case against segregation in schools during the Brown versus Board of Education decision. The chief justice at the time was Earl Warren, and he ruled that separate is inherently unequal. In other words, oops, that separate but equal is a violation of the 14th Amendment because separate is inherently unequal. And the significance about the Brown versus board, uh, board decision is that even though this had only applied to, or, or even though the court case had originated with schooling, Brown versus Board struck down Plessy versus Ferguson. It struck down this idea of separate but equal by saying separate is inherently unequal. And with that was probably the most significant legal victory that the civil rights movement could essentially ask for. Now. The Supreme Court ruling is one thing, right? It's for one thing to say segregation is against the law of the land. But as you can see from this map here, the United States was, uh, you know, at least a third of it was very heavily segregated. All of the red states are states in which segregation was mandatory. Um, all of the uh, blue states are states where segregation was optional. So you could have some institutions segregated. And the rest was pretty much you didn't have any segregation there. And so while the Supreme Court ruling was important, it would also be a matter of enforcement. So when it actually came to desegregating the schools themselves, it was a rather slow process. In fact, way too slow for some advocates of the civil rights movement. In Little Rock, Little Rock is in Arkansas, uh, nine students had attempted to attend school. Now uh, here's a couple of them here. Uh, when they were refused entry into the white school, this was now a white school, now desegregated so that both white and, student, uh, white and black students could go. Uh, when they att had attempted to go to school, the governor, Orville Faubes, refused uh, 
them entry. You know, you had uh, mobs and a massive amount of people going out there and really trying to do whatever they can. Fabus himself stood in front of the door of the school, doing everything that they can to really prevent these black students from going to this school. The president at the time, President Eisenhower, responded by sending in troops and forcing desegregation. So this was important because on the one hand, what this marked was that, you know, there would be some resistance to Brown versus Board. But on the other hand, it showed that the president, in this case, Eisenhower, was willing to support what the uh, Supreme Court had done. And that was very important because the Supreme Court doesn't have any tools to enforce. It can simply just make rulings on the law of the land. But when it actually comes out to the, you know, to enforcing it, it's either the president or the states themselves. And President Eisenhower was willing to enforce uh, the Supreme Court decision. Uh, the response by whites, particularly in the states where uh, segregation was, um, particularly where segregation was the law of the land, were resistant. Uh, they re wanted to resist and they did resist Brown versus Board at any turn. The Southern Manifesto was a document signed by 100 uh, Southern congressmen resisting uh, Brown v. Board. In other words, these were politicians in the US Congress who had more or less signed this document stating that they're gonna do everything in their power to resist desegregation. They did so under the guise of states' rights, which indicates that the federal government has no right to dictate what, for example, the state of Florida chooses to do. If Florida right, wants to uh, segregate, if they want to create separate facilities, well, that's the right of Florida and not the federal government. So rather than looking at it as a matter of the 14th Amendment, which is the Equal Protection Clause, they look at it, or the South looks at it more under the 10th Amendment, which is the state's rights amendment. It pretty much says that any power not de delegated to the federal government, therefore is delegated to, uh, to the states. Uh, similarly, the uh, Brown versus Board decision and the, the kind of slow and steady process towards desegregation led to a revive, revival of the Ku Klux Klan. They once again uh, had a purpose, this time to oppose civil rights. Uh, the Klan had been very popular in the 1920s. In fact, during the 1920s, the Klan was at its height in terms of popularity. It was largely opposed, even though it was opposed to the progress being made by African Americans, the Klan of the 1920s was also largely opposed to immigration. It was anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish. It had a lot to say given the um, uh, heavy immigration that happened during the Gilded Age, but the Great Depression had more or less put the Klan out of business. It comes back again in the 1950s and 1960s, this time in order to oppose civil rights. And uh, resistant could also be violent. Emmett Till was a young, young black boy who was murdered in Mississippi. And the, uh, his murder got national headlines because uh, his mom was willing to have an open casket funeral. He was uh, beaten to death. And so by having an open casket funeral, it shocked really Northern audiences to see some of the brutality that could take place uh, in the South, particularly in Mississippi. The only thing that Emmett Till was guilty of was uh, saying something to a white woman that was deemed inappropriate and he was killed for doing that. He had been from the North, so he didn't really understand uh, the customs of the South in that way. The, uh, the perpetrator who killed Emmett Till was found not guilty by an all white jury, even though the evidence against him was very strong. So this, in a lot of uh, cases, sparked national outrage. And you know the civil rights movement uh, will need the public opinion on its side to continue to progress. Um, also a major victory happened in Montgomery, Alabama. The Montgomery bus boycott is significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, what it is, uh, Rosa Parks, who was a civil rights advocate, refused to give up her seat on a segregated 
bus. So Rosa Parks, a black woman, refused to give up her seat to a white person on a Montgomery bus, Montgomery, Alabama. The police were called, she was arrested. Her arrest sparked off a massive boycott. If you're not familiar, a boycott is a refusal to buy a product. So the African-American population in Montgomery, Alabama refused to ride the buses until they desegregated the buses, allowing whites and blacks to sit wherever they pleased or you know, sit in the same sections. Uh, the Montgomery bu bus boycott was important for three reasons. Uh, first one is that it witnessed the rise of a leader. Martin Luther King Jr. emerged as a leader of the civil rights movement. Number two, it proposed a strategy. By boycotting, the civil rights movement was using nonviolence. This would be a strategy that the civil rights movement would continue to use in the future and would turn out to be successful. And the third reason why it was important or significant was that the bus system or the buses became desegregated. That is thanks to the pressure that you know the consuming population there in Montgomery, Alabama put on the bus system, uh, they were forced to go back on their policy of segregation and uh, the bus system in Montgomery, Alabama became integrated. 